to the latest episode of The Claws Corner. For me, the greatest band in the world and the band that had the biggest impact on both music and pop culture is and always will be the Beatles. Which brings me to today's guests. One was a Mercy Beat musician and acquaintance of the Beatles. The other was a Cavern regular who went on to date both George and Paul. They are also the founders of the most successful Beatles exhibition in the world and authors of The Birth of the Beatles Story. It's my pleasure to welcome both Bernadette, a.k.a. Bernie, and Mike Byrne to the Claws Corner. How are you? <laughs> We're good, thank you. Oh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, I was telling you off the air. Ah, such a great book. I recommend right now, right after you're done watching this interview, go out and buy this book immediately. The Beatles are going to be there forever. You know, like Shakespeare, they... They, I mean, when they, you know, they are legends in their own lifetime, you know, I mean, yeah. they, they are given the status now of, of um, people who are killed, who are already dead for a hundred years. Yeah. You know, the, their longevity is guaranteed. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, like I said earlier, I said, Paul does not have to do anything. Ringo too. Ringo doesn't have to do anything. They can yeah. stop right now and they're, they'll, they're in all the history books. They're they're legendary. They're going to live on forever. Yeah. But they do it because music is their life, and they just enjoy doing it, and they love being yeah. with the fans. And I, I that I have so yeah. much respect for that. Instead yeah. Of just and, they, and Paul actually, I don't know about Ringo doesn't, but Paul actually just came out with an album maybe a year or two ago, and it's good. I loved it. I I actually enjoyed the music, and this is. I want to bring, I'll say one like I was so happy to see him in concert last night. That's why I keep bringing this up because the yeah. first time I've ever seen him, I didn't have a chance to be there at the cavern like you two, but <laughs> um, he was saying, he goes, you know what? He goes, I can always tell when somebody likes a song because I see all their cell phones lit up. He goes, I can tell yeah. when I play a new song, all the cell phones die down. And it looks like a black hole out there. He goes, you know what though? <laughs> he goes, I don't care. I'm playing what I want to play. And I said, yes, because yes. he, played, he played a mixture of old, new, classics, favorites. He played, I said, three hours worth of material. But I love the fact that he's doing it for himself. And that's what he said. He goes, I really don't care if you like it or not. Yeah. I like yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. I, I, th I think that's great, you know. And it's a bit like um, the, the exhibition that we created. It's now 32 years old. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure that after, well after we're gone, it, that will still be, be there because every year more and more people visit Liverpool and they come to the Beatles story because we tell the story well. We, we you know, the, the, the care and attention that we put into it was phenomenal, I well, think. And everybody there, says the same. Like, and as Bernie says, we were there. You know, mm. it, it, it came from the horse's mouth, <laughs> not from the other end. You speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get to that very, very soon. Because um, there's, I love the fact how you broke it into 18 different sections. Yeah. But before uh, that, though, I, was, I found this surprising because, well, in December of 1980, John was shot, which everybody knows. And that was the catalyst for generating an increase in Beatle tourism. But why was the Liverpool City Council, why they have zero interest in promoting the Beatles? That's what I found surprising at first, but now I understand why. Wow. You know, the city at the time was going through a bad period economically. Yeah. It, it didn't have anything going for it. There was, oh, hang on, we've got a phone call. Sorry. Everybody wants to be on the show. Everybody, yes, it's our son. Yeah. He's in Berlin, which you believe. <laughs> our son is working in Berlin. Yeah, he, he's a good show. <laughs> have you heard of Robbie Williams? Yes, I have. So yeah, he, our, he our son is a, a Robbie Williams tribute act. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> a very sure. good one, too. A very good. He's, you de definitely have a musical family. I love it. <laughs> now, now, what, what about your daughter? Does she do anything musical? No, no she just no, organizes she him. But she is she is so involved in music. Yeah. She's not musical, but so involved she in music. She knows a lot of she knows a lot of a lot of people in music. Um, she's great. She's she knows so much. She knows more than us. Um, <laughs> 
Where were we? Um, the city city in yeah. the 80s was dismal. Bad, yeah. um, John Lennon, Beatles, well, yeah. John Lennon was murdered in 80. In 81, we had riots in Liverpool, you know, I mean, street riots, yeah. burning down the Buildings. parts of the city, you know, in a poor part of the city. And um, this... This um, we also had strikes. We were, you know, we were a, 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 a seaport and lots of docks. The dockers what were on strike money. all the time. The city council was run by a militant uh, part, which which um, didn't like the government. Didn't like the government. Didn't at like all. today, actually. <laughs> and. Um, you know, they they didn't they they had no idea about culture in any way, and so they they didn't rate the Beatles. You know, I mean, at the I mean, for Rich, when we opened the first opened the Beatles story in 1990, some local people would look at the Beatles story and say, "What have the Beatles done for Liverpool?" You know, um, so so there's there's that kind of mentality, mentality yeah. apathy, yeah. like. But the eighties were a bad time for Liverpool, particularly after the riots. But to me, that was the best thing that could have happened because it was the catalyst that made the government come up to Liverpool and put a lot of money the into area. changing changing the concept, the image of Liverpool. And and they Nothing. they succeeded, and it was despite the council. Um, we also had the beginnings of um, a tourism board, but not not very serious. They they didn't do very much. It wasn't you know. We also have football, a very strong well, football. Obviously, in this football city. terrific. Liverpool yeah. football yeah. always did very very well, but the Beatles, you know. Nobody was going, hang on. Well, sorry, a couple of people were going, yes. You know, we mentioned it in the book. Um, the, these two people, Ron Jones and Pam Wiltshire, they started Beatle Weekends. But that was only in 83 when, be, when Bernie became the a guy. Dad, yeah. But all through the 80s, seriously, until we opened the Beatles story and they had a change of tourism board leader mm. because as we say in the book um the head of tourism once was overheard saying the beatles are rubbish <laughs> ah. <laughs> and he was there. he's the head of tourism i mean you could imagine <laughs> the head of tourism in memphis going elvis ah forget him <laughs> i don't i don't understand that because I st actually i still don't understand because people in the other states would probably wouldn't even think of Liverpool if it wasn't for the Beatles at that time. They actually, because they left Liverpool and went abroad, they put <coughs> Liverpool on the map. So they actually yeah. helped Liverpool by leaving. If they stayed yeah, in Liverpool, course. they would have stayed, been at the Cavern, maybe some bigger clubs afterwards, but there's no way that they'd be, you know, people would say, oh yeah, they, they were a good yeah. band, but you know, they, they never, you know, like they always say, you never made it until you made it in the States, in America, but yeah. which I, so I, I'm, they actually, I, I know, I don't see their line of thinking, but I guess there was a lot of resentment, like, oh, they were ours. No, they're, they belong yeah. to the world. They, yeah. they, they left. They sold they out. Left. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Left. yeah. There was a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always laugh when people say this. There's somebody will say, "Oh, I love this band. I love this band." And then when they get popular, oh, they sold out. It's like, isn't that yeah. the job of a band to become bigger and stronger and better? And I think that some people just get mad because that at the first when they first started, it's theirs. It belongs to them and nobody else. Nobody else knows about it. And then when everybody else starts to hear about it, oh, forget it. You know, they, yeah. they start yeah. to, yeah. shame, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it, it's a shame. I'm I'm always happy for like success for anybody so i, I yes. really love the fact that yeah. they, it's just I, I think it's i'm so glad again i keep saying this over and over again that you two are bringing this story to life you did and and you're telling it for people for generations and generations to enjoy the beatles uh, from the very yes. beginning all the way till oh now. yeah so you we mentioned ron jones and pam Wilshire. i want to talk about the cavern mecca what's that the, well, the Cavern Mecca was really the first. They were a couple of fans who started Cavern Mecca after the original Cavern Club was pulled down. Um, 
and people were still talking about the cavern. And um, they were fans who, in Matthew Street, they took over a, a little warehouse sort of room, wasn't it? And they created their own little fan club, as it were. So if people were coming from overseas, uh, there was a Beatles shop had opened. It was down Matthew Street, but down underground. And it was, um, they could get Beatles souvenirs and things like that, but there was no stage, nothing to... So uh, I don't know, how, how did they open? I think they just... They were just big fans, big fans of the yeah. Beatles and th they, they started a little shop first yeah. and then, then Cavern Mecca. Mm -hmm. And it was a meeting place for, for Beatles Beatle fans. fans yeah. and, and they played music there. And um, they even got, um, when they reopened it, uh, a, a few years later, they got Victor Spinetti, yeah. who'd been with the Beatles in A Hard Day's Night, yeah. That he he came and supported them. Yes. He he was a lovely man. He kept you know, the story alive, really. They kept the story in Matthew Street but that alive. Was, that was 1979, Rich, you know? And then 1980, John is murdered. And and again, they they you know did tributes to John and another promoter, Sam Leach, organized a vigil. Mm. Um the night after John was murdered at St. George's Hall. Yes. And thousands of people turned out for that. But the council in the background still Didn't wasn't, wasn't interested at all, you know. But Kavamecca carried on, carried yeah, they on. they kept the torch burning um, away. You know. And they, they went on till 1984. When the new cavern, when the new cavern yeah. was open, the cavern, the original cavern was underground, and it was all filled in in the end. They they demolished the whole building. You know, I mean, and it was I mean, in. You, you know isn't that crazy? Mm. The council knocked down the cavern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's lots of protests, but you know they didn't want to know. And it was uh, although the cavern is there is a cavern there now owned by Cavern City Tours. It's um, it's about three rows three blocks up really from where the original one was it's not on the exact site in fact i think there's an electrical yeah it's, and it's um, yeah. you know it's much lower deeper than the original yeah, yeah. one was but you know we've got we've got a a cavern club mm. um but but the 80s were you know liverpool was in the doldrums but but it's it was when it was the beginning of what we see today as tourism, Beatles tourism. Yeah. But Bernie was the first, one of the, the first Beatle guides. Yeah, I, you know. I saw a notice in our evening newspaper advertising a job for Beatle. Would you like to be a Beatle guide? And I said, oh, I can do that. <laughs> so um, I became one of the earliest. And we even um, had to take a PVC driving test because we had a little minibus which you could drive 12 people around the city or showing them all the Beatle sites and uh, playing the music, you know, and that's how Beatle tours really began. That I think in 1982. Uh, Liverpool yeah. now is a guide. <laughs> well, that was in 1982 that you became a qualified guide, one of the first group of qualified Beatle guides. But I want to go to 1983 because our mutual friend Charles Rosenay, the great Charles, I want to thank him, first of all, for reaching out to your daughter and setting up this interview. But I have known him for years because not from the Beatles tour, he actually runs an a couple tours and one of the tours he ran that I went on was a, a tour to uh, Transylvania, Romania. Mm. I had such a great wow. time because I'm, I'm a huge horror movie fan. I love history. Yeah. So it was, a, it was the the best combination of Vlad the Impaler and Dracula, Dracula. So wow. right. That, so I've known him since probably that was 2005. But I know that, you know, back in 1983, he started running Beatles conventions all over the U.S., and yeah. he began bringing groups of people to Liverpool. What was That's his right. initial reaction when he went to Liverpool and said, huh? He was, he was actually <laughs> embarrassed because yeah. there was no, there was a lack of appreciation of the Beatles. Terrible, yeah. It was awful. Yeah. Nothing we at all. We had to battle with the local council, didn't we? Nothing until the eight, eight, late eighties when, when Cavern City tours, you know, started doing Beatle conventions. Um, and, I, and I'd always been in show business in one way or another. Um, I, I was a compare myself. I was a compare host for many years. And um, so I, I, I used to compare the Beatle conventions. Um, and I'd meet Charles 
at the conventions, you know. Mm -hmm. So I knew Charles then. And I think in the late 80s, after we'd been to Dallas, you know about the Dallas story? Oh, we're going to get to that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, oh, Charles and I met every year. Well, we, we met Charles every year at the convention. And, you know, Charles is so... Oh, so lively. Yeah. He's, he knows so much. Yeah. He knows more about the Beatles than we, we do. do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, and then Charles, when we started the Beatles story or were looking to start it, he, he was there at the beginning. Mm. And he was one of the, the chosen few yeah. to come and have a look at where we were going to build the Beatles story. Yeah great guy and Charles keep up the great work I, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping I cannot believe I have not done this yet but I'm hoping to go next August on uh, his Beatles tour so oh brilliant brilliant yeah, oh, well, I, nice I've always wanted to go first. yeah mm -hmm. so hopefully uh maybe on the tour I don't know if did does he still go to your place oh we we will give you the personal tour <laughs> all right well you know what <laughs> i'm gonna hold you to that i'm gonna i'll see you next yeah, august you're, right. you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> mike talk about your time with the liverpool echo uh not well sorry um was it the echo um the mersey mart oh so for some reason maybe i don't know did so it, mersey did mart. It <laughs> the echo maybe no I, I wasn't maybe with there the was echo. A, maybe there was a picture in the echo uh we had pictures in the echo with the road runners, yeah, but not, right. but my, my, um, I was with um, job. <laughs> <laughs> the Mersey Mart and it was, it was Liverpool's largest free newspaper. And okay. so I, I ended up, I ended up there. Um, well, because I, I needed, job. when, when Bernadette and I got married, you know, I suddenly needed a proper job. Um, I, I'd, I'd been doing, cabaret and theatre work for six, seven years. And I, um, again, you grow out of that and you go, okay, I think I'll settle down again <laughs> and get a proper job. Yeah. But this proper job was not a proper job. Um, the guy who owned the newspaper was a guy called Phil Burt Russell, who was a friend of mine from the Roadrunner days. Yeah, and uh, he gave me a job and he didn't even know what job it was. It was so my, my job was promotions manager, which just covered anything because uh, the free newspapers at the time, I don't know if they're like that in America, but they're all adverts. So there was no, no editorial content. And so he wanted some editorial content. So he thought that I could provide that mm -hmm. which is what I did you know I went out looked for stories and took photographs and wrote wrote different pieces and it went in but also I, I'd been very good at organizing events exactly. so I, I did a lot of what what Phil wanted was someone to um, get a community spirit type thing going so I organized a lot of charity shows it's a knockout competitions, sponsored swims, sponsored all night, mm. disco <laughs> marathons, sponsored jogs. Okay. So we raised about £250,000 for the local community during my six years there. Yeah. So, so Mersey Mart was a great place, but the guy who owned it was our first investor. Okay, that's... I'm going to fire the guy who did my research. He's history. <laughs> I don't know where you got <laughs> Liverpool echo from. <laughs> but that's this one I know is true. I want to talk about the International Garden Festival and its impact. Mm. Mm. Again, <laughs> do you want to tell me? <laughs> no, no, no. 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 <laughs> oh, yes. Um, ben, ben has got a nice story about that. Um, again, it came from the Liverpool riots, it came out of that. Um, Michael Heseltine, who worked for Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister at the time, who didn't like Liverpool at all. She hated Liverpool. You know, we, we were that Labour 
Labour people lot up in Liverpool with the militant council. She hated Liverpool. But because we had a riot, she had a responsibility to make sure that this didn't happen again. So she sent Michael Heseltine, her government minister, who, who was great. He had a, a vision. He ignored all the local politics, mm -hmm. ignored the, the council, the land, he? ignored the branch. militant. He looked around Liverpool, spent three weeks, three weeks in the city looking for opportunities. And one of them was to regenerate the Albert Dock, which is where the Beatles story is. But the other thing, this, he saw a piece of land, wasteland, something like 65 acres of wasteland, and he transformed it into an international, international garden festival, which started in Germany after the war. Mm. And this was G Germany's way of regenerating cities. And they would go, each city in Germany, mm. each year would be nominated a garden festival. Mm. And, and Michael Heseltine had seen this yeah. and said, let's so do an international. Didn't he? Got and each we had 60 international countries from around the world who all put, built their own garden at this festival. Yeah, so there was a it last, garden. It lasted, kind of what, 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 what kind of garden? There was the Dutch garden, the Chinese garden with the pagoda and everything, you know, the Canadian garden with the Rockies, yeah. they had the Rockies, the waterfalls coming down it. Um, <clears throat> so each garden was built in the style of the country mm -hmm. it represented. And it lasted for six months. And each week, one of the countries, it would be their week. And so they would, they would bring performers and um, their culture, their food, and that would be a week. And it was the most, it was great. And it brought three, three, over three million visitors to Liverpool that year. So that was 1984. Um, the other amazing thing, well, I mean, that was, it was just fantastic. And I was there most days, you know, writing about it, taking photographs. And you've seen some of the photographs in the book. Um, fortunately, we've got pictures in the book about the, the garden festival. Um, but Bern, Bern, Bernie at the time was, you know, guiding, doing the Beatle guiding yeah. and yeah. tell the story. Um, I had the, a visit from the Venezuelan consulate who wanted to see the garden that the South Americans had done. And so I had to take him there. Uh, we had a little minibus, I think, and we took um, him and all. He had about four people with him. And when we arrived, there was nobody had been informed that he was coming. So I had to sort of tell the people who were on the gates, um, this is the Venezuelan consulate, can you know show us around? So they took us inside and sat us in this kind of uh, asbestos shed, which was a tea room. <laughs> there was all dirty cups and things around. And we were sitting there after about 15 minutes. <laughs> he kind of looked around and he thought I could see his heckles were rising, you know. Um, yeah, nobody had come back. They'd gone to look for somebody in charge. And the next thing he stormed out and said, I'm going. <laughs> and That's I had funny. to drive him back to Liverpool to his hotel immediately. Oh, it was very embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> well, that one's not in the book. <laughs> Yes, I don't think so. Anyway, so the, the, it was a fantastic success. And, uh, but the, the, the same year, um, we had this, you know, Beatles City opened, who, which came into our lives two years later. Yeah. And the tall ships, international tall ships came. The Art of the Beatles. The new cavern opened. 1984 was a pivotal year for Liverpool and, and putting it onto at least the, the, map, yeah. the British map, mm. you know. Um, and I think that was the start of people changing their perception about Liverpool, although Bernie and I still had to fight that bad image for many years later. Now, you talk about that in the book, and I, like I said, I still find it so surprising that people are so resentful after all those years. They should be happy that Beatles put yeah. Liverpool on the map. And I don't yeah. know why you have to fight with them to say, 
No, yeah. it's actually a good thing they left. But um, so you did Beetle City. And then in March of 1986, Mike, you became an events manager for the Trans World Festival Gardens. Yeah, that took over from the International Garden Festival, which which, which ended. Um, Transworld was another idea from another businessman who said, I'm going to turn this into a theme park now, you know, and we want an events manager. So I I left Mersey Mart and went went as the events manager because I I I'd, I'd made a lot of contacts. I so I, I I was charged with putting six months events on in this and which which I did. It was entertainers. It was jugglers. It was skydivers. It was uh, the the red arrows fly past anything you know that was entertaining. I organised uh, for six months. Um, unfortunately, um, the weather was bad the whole year. And we had a rubbish promotions team. The marketing team was abysmal and, and we didn't get the numbers. And so by the end of the six months, September came and it was, it was obvious that it was going to fail and it was going to close down. But <laughs> as luck would have it, <laughs> We were called into the managing, the chief executive's office who said, we're closing next week, but there's one job going at Beetle City. And I went, I'll have it. <laughs> I love you it. know, what, what, are the, what are the odds of that kind of thing happening? You know, so the next week I'm sitting in Beetle City. I love how everything just fell right into place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're lucky in some ways. Yeah, it was amazing. I didn't know what I was doing, but <laughs> I was in charge of Beatles City. I, I, was, a good prom, I was a good promotions manager. Yeah, I, I knew marketing, and I could, I could organize events. So, mm. you know, I, I did my best. But Beatles City was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it didn't appeal to the whole family. It only appealed to Beatles fans. And there weren't enough visiting at the time to make it pay. You know, so it was gonna, it was gonna fail anyway. Um, but then again, then along came this other entrepreneur who said, I'm going to take it to America. Yep. Will you come along and be the boss? And, <laughs> and I want Bernie to come and be the guide. Well, I think it's perfect that his name is JR. <laughs> he wanted to take it to Dallas. And uh, for people from the 80s who remember the, the soap opera in the U.S. called Dallas, yeah. who shot yeah. JR, <laughs> this yeah. guy, the way you describe him in the book is hilarious. So let's talk about him. He comes up, he goes, I want to bring this to America. It's going to be in Dallas. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Why, are we going to Dallas? Yeah. Why are we going to the Bible Belt yeah. where, yeah. where they burned the Beatles records? <laughs> and, uh, and our partners are the West End Marketplace and South Fork Ranch, <laughs> which has a real cowboy in charge. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, you know... It was going to be a disaster, but I didn't know at the time because we we didn't have anything else to do. You know, I didn't have another job. I, I would have gone back to singing and stuff like that. But this guy says, no, let's go to America. You'll be in charge. You're the general manager. You'll stay in a fabulous hotel. Bernie will come with you. You can bring the kids over and uh, you'll have your own car. Oh, you know. I can't say no to that. <laughs> and, you, and it was good, you know. He promised promised me the world, you know. Um, Funny. And, and it was great. It was great for the first month. <laughs> There's something that happened, but before that, I, I want to get into what happened. Um, you had an unexpected visitor to the Dallas location. It was a former drummer of the Beatles. Oh, Just mm, yeah. That was right in the middle of the stay in Dallas, which was going very well. And we'd, we'd met some uh, nice. real great Dallas Beatle fans who had excellent collections. 
And one day, and, and because, because of who we were, you know, because we were from Liverpool, because I had played at the cabin, because Bernie had been out with two Beatles, we were looked after quite well. The Hard Rock Cafe gave us VIP memberships. Um, the radio stations were in, interviewing us. And one of the radio stations rang me up and said, Mike, Pete Best's in town. I went, wow. Mm. Okay, right. Um, what's he doing? He wants to come and see the exhibition, or we, we would like to bring him to the exhibition tomorrow night when it's closed. Will you stay open for Pete? Of course we will. And the three Dallas collectors, well, they were just over the moon <laughs> because they were going to meet Pete Best, you know, <laughs> I'm a, a hero. So, so Pete came with, with the, the radio station guys and, and I was, I had to give them the tour of Beatles City, Dallas. But, but you know, I was embarrassed <laughs> because here I am, Pete's been thrown out of the Beatles and I'm, I'm walking him round, oh. you know, this tribute to yeah. his bandmates. And there's the pictures of him on the wall oh, and the yeah. oh, So I, I was... I felt uncomfortable, you know. How did he feel at that time? That he was that was he at peace with everything? But by that time, I think I think he'd come. He'd come to terms with it, and obviously, if he was in, he was doing a tour in America. Yeah. He was getting paid, so mm -hmm. he was okay. And then we went out later. We went to the Hard Rock Cafe. We had meals and drinks, and he was fine, and we had a laugh. But. <laughs> It, it was um, it was a it was an amazing time in Dallas, mm. but and it could have been so much better, but because of Jr. He yep. was such an idiot. He didn't. Who well, he didn't he didn't like the Beatles. He just he just saw it as saw this. He saw money. Yeah, that's all he saw. saw. Yeah, yeah. dollar signs. Well, I want to talk. Speaking of stupidity, I want to talk about the uh, Apple front door. What Apple did JR do with that? Uh, sorry, he's just gone to put a light on. Where it's suddenly gone very dark here. So, oh. I was, you know, it's funny. I was going to mention something about that. It, it seemed like I wasn't sure if what happened, but it got, I mean, you could still see everybody, you know, well. It's just they yeah. did get a little bit darker. But that, that's good. It's, uh, we've got a big window on the left here, and it's suddenly gone very dark. Uh oh. Uh, the Apple Probably. door. About the Apple door. The Apple door. Yes. <laughs> This Beetle City was, you know, a million quids worth of memorabilia, super, super stuff. And um, the Apple door was one of the items. And behind, sorry, behind JR's, behind our back, JR had done a deal with Japan. the biggest Beatles collector in Japan, Mr. Hamada. Mm. who ran a Beatles fan club which had thousands, 50,000 50, members. Mm. So Mr. Hamada wanted the Apple door for his own exhibition and was willing to pay JR some money. So JR hadn't told South Fork Ranch, he hadn't told West End Marketplace, and it was on its way out. I didn't know. I was just told, Mike, will you pack the door up? As soon as, soon as they found out, they, they put an embargo on the door and I was escorted out by the police. <laughs> I was kind of arrested and walked out and told, you cannot come back into the exhibition until this is all sorted out. So... You know, but you got you got arrested. What happened to Jr. with this? Oh, Jr. was just he was bluffing his way through everything, and he 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 had no social graces. He he upset people. He upset all the people around him. He didn't know. He 
He didn't know anything. He didn't understand the Beatles. He didn't understand tourism. He didn't understand how you must work with other people in other countries and how you, mm -hmm. you know, don't treat people like servants. Mm -hmm. You have to be respectful. He didn't know. And he upset so many people, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so in the end, he fell out with South Fork Ranch. The guy who owned South Fork Ranch didn't pay JR. Mm -hmm. And consequently, I wasn't getting paid. Yep. So mm -hmm. in the end, it got to December. We'd been there since um, August. And it had done very, very well. You know, we had 40,000 visitors in three months, you know, coming from everywhere. And uh, so, in, but, it, but the writing was on the wall in December. The other, the other writing on the wall was when I went home for a quick visit in November, went to the tourist board and said, have you seen JR? He told me he'd been to see you and that he was bringing the exhibition back to Liverpool. They said, no, he's not been in touch. So I went, hmm. The right. you know, alarm bells. Mm. But again, everything falls right into place for you because that's when you and Bernie said, you know what? Why don't we open up our own exhibition? Yep. Yeah, mm. it was not quite as quick as that, but it was, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It was because of that yeah. that we came back with no job, Christmas Eve. <laughs> Christmas Eve, no job. But, you know, we had a great Christmas because we hadn't seen each other for months. And um, it was great to see the family and everything. Immediately in January, I was straight into the tourism board. We've got to have a Beatle exhibition. Come on. You know, Bernie had been, by then, Bernie's taking tours out every day. Mm -hmm. And it was only the tourism board who didn't see it. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> but, you know, as, mm -hmm. as I say in the book, I was given some money to do a feasibility study on why Liverpool should have a Beatle exhibition. You know, they were the only people who didn't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, very quickly, I turned around and as you said, I said, come on, we'll do it ourselves. And we did. <laughs> and the rest is history. So, but why would, why'd you pick the Britannia Pavilion at the Albert Dock? Ah. <laughs> that was down to Bernie. Uh, yeah, we'd gone, um, we used to do what we called reckeys, where you'd go to see something before you ever did a guided tour about it. And this particular day, we were taken down to where the development was taking place. And the basement where Beatle Story is today hadn't been developed. Uh, we, so we could only see the top floor where the Maritime Museum was, and eventually later on the Tate Gallery came on that floor and then the water was in the middle but um, down in the basement it was just like a dusty cellar but we went down to have a look at it anyway because that's where the tobacco bales used to be stored in the old days when the tobacco was brought in you know the by boat they were stored down below anyway as soon as I saw it it was stood on it was built on these <coughs> steel posts the pillars the pillars, yeah. the pillars and there was brick brick wall sort of in archways and as soon as I saw it I thought gosh that reminds me of the cabin so I went straight back home and I said to Mike I've seen it I've seen the place where we should have the cabin you know uh, or have the Beatles exhibition yeah. and uh, we, we went down to have another look didn't we and as soon as he saw it he, he said yeah we've got to do it now you know and I think we were crazy at the time but we were just <laughs> just absolutely we thought, well, we couldn't have a better place. It's in a tourist attraction already. The people are coming, and yeah. the you know the space was there, and we we didn't have a clue how we were going to do it because, as Mike said, we didn't have any money of our own at the time. But we begged, stole, and borrowed practically, and even the furnishings. Once we got that cabin, we went to um, old warehouses and found old chairs and found all sorts of things. We had the walls bricked up and painted so it looked like the uh, condensation was running down the walls and that kind of thing. So it was just very exciting putting it all together, you know. So that, that was it. That was the start. Well, then why, how did you finally settle on the name, The Beatles Story, A Magical Experience? Wow. Ah. Well, well, again, we, 
we we always brainstorm everything you know what what we do together we brainstorm um it was like coming up with the 18 different features we, we probably had 30 features but then we cut them all down and said no there here's the 18 important ones you know this is what because we were so lucky to have the Beatles City experience because we saw what went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. We, we learned from their mistakes yeah. and we, we said, no, nah, yeah, we, we don't, want, want, we don't want memorabilia. We don't want glass cases. We don't want cardboard walls. We want an experience. We're going to take people back in time. And they will walk through and they will experience what we experienced at, in Liverpool, you know, mm. Matthew Street, the cavern. And so everything, everything in the Beatles story is solid brick. There is no, you know, there's no cardboard walls. Everything is solid. So, you know, we, we, um, we learned that very quickly. Yeah. And, uh, that that's how it that's how it became a reality and the albert dock itself has atmosphere you know it had the atmosphere the tourists were coming to see the albert dock not not the beatles story but they were coming to the maritime museum and the waterfront and and so it was the natural place for us to do it and the fact the fact the big thing with the cavern was that you went down these steps you went into the basement and the beauty of the Albert Dock, of where the Britannia Pavilion, we go down into the basement. And it was like living, going to the cavern. Yeah. And that's, 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 the, yeah. that's the atmosphere you get when you go into the basement now. I mean, the Albert Dock is, is a great tourist hole. You know, everything around is a tourist attraction because we have the huge cruise ships coming into Liverpool now. And they can literally walk across the front of the waterfront where the pier is and into the Albert Dock and you know crew people on cruisers don't particularly want to be bussed if they want to see places like Penny Lane they can take a coach tour and the buses will take them out to Penny Lane to the Beatles homes and that kind of thing but if they yeah. just want to say they've only got an hour or so in the in the city they can walk to the Beatles story from the ship so um, that that was another selling yeah, point. We, you know, we we thought everything through, you know, so carefully, and uh, it's paid off. I'm glad you heard that, and I'm already looking forward to next August. I cannot wait to see this. <laughs> oh yeah, we want we want to see you. Yeah, it'd be nice to uh, meet you. Yeah. It's gonna be great. So I know you mentioned when you first had this idea, you said, "How are we gonna pay for this?" So how much did all of this cost? It cost £700,000 in 1990, which is the equivalent to one and, um, one and a half million pounds now. No, 1.7 million, I think, now. Mm -hmm. It would cost today. Um, originally, we had 350000 and to get the the magical bits that we wanted to do. You were asking about the name, the Beatles story, a magical experience. Well, that came about because the experience was the thing. We wanted it to be immersive so that people get in and go, wow, I'm in Hamburg now. Yeah. Our Hamburg set, it's not very big, but it's got all this, the Star Club signs, all the neon, yeah. but it has and the original cobbles, uh, original cobbles, from even Germany. from Germany. Mm. We got the cobbles from Germany yeah. because there are different shaped cobbles of British cobbles. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of detail. So from from the Beatle, from the Star Club, we have the music of the Beatles playing at the Star Club. In the background, there's German voices. So. Each section was to take people back yeah. and give them an experience of how it was. And then you go back to Liverpool, into the Merseybeat office, and you go out into Matthew Street. We even changed the temperature in different sections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? 
really put a lot of thought and a lot of work into this. I could tell. Yeah. And that's what yeah. I love. Yeah. Because, yeah, you said it's not just you're walking through seeing cases and cases of memorabilia. It's immersive and it's an experience. And I love the fact that, like you said, walking through, you feel like you're in Hamburg at the time. You feel like you're in the cavern right now. It's just the fact that you, without any money, you put all this together and you made this a great experience. So question is, how did you raise the money to get all of this done? Well, it was all, all due to my, to my friend who I worked for at Merzimart, Phil Bertwistle, who put the first, looked at my fees of my business plan mm. and said, I'll put a hundred thousand pound in. Mm. And without him doing that, we wouldn't have got the rest because mm. I I wouldn't have had the Contact the, the confidence mm. to go out and get the rest, I the think. Banks, because he he introduced me to two other businessmen, and that's Thank all they you. were, mm. um, who put in 150,000. So that was 250,000. We raised 40,000 pound ourselves because we didn't have any money. We, mm -hmm. we had nothing. Well, we raised 40,000 pound through my dad and the bank. Um, so, so what have we got? 250. Uh, that's and the books and I, I got a, I got a 60,000 pound grant from the English Tourist Board, which was supposed to be repaid, but they're still waiting for it. Um, <laughs> That's not gone in the book. Ber Ber Bernie's got this. Um, I wish. <laughs> yeah, so, so we were up to £350,000 and we thought, oh, that'll be enough. And then we were told if we wanted this experiential, this immersive, we were going to have to spend another three hundred and fifty thousand pounds. So I managed through through someone else to find a major partner who who came in with the three fifty thousand. So that's how we raised the money. But if it hadn't been for the first hundred thousand, mm. I think we would have given up. That's why our book is dedicated to him. It's dedicated to a guy called Phil Bertwistle, who was a, a teenage friend of ours, really, wasn't he? Yeah. Before. And he lives in Spain now, and he's not very well. He had a stroke three years ago. So he's not very sad. He's not, not well. But the book is dedicated to him. And without him, I don't think it would be there. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, so now it would probably be so much easier because now with the internet, all you have to do is start a Kickstarter or some kind of, oh, I, are you a Beatles fan? Donate $10 or as much as you can yeah. donate. Now you could probably get millions and millions because there's so many Beatles fans out there and they would love to see something like that. Oh. You did it at a time when there was no internet. No, no you're right. Yeah. So that's even more impressive. So yeah, it's great that you kept a lot of your connections and you have a lot of great friends and people wanted to help you out throughout the year. So I'm very, very happy to hear that. But they helped you with that. Did you ever encounter any issues with getting permission from Apple to use original photos, film clips, and the Beatles music? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that was um, that was fun. So, so yeah. So we we've, we've got the idea. We found the venue. We start the architect. We get a great architect, and then we've got to get the permission to play the songs to yes. show the film. And um, so I I write to Apple once, ignored twice, ignored. Eventually, Derek, Derek Taylor, who is the right-hand man of Neil Aspinall, who is in charge now, he, he meets me and he says, I'll meet you in the crypt of St. Martin's in the field. <laughs> okay. And that, that's a big church in London. I'll meet you in the crypt. Oh, okay. <laughs> so... I took my plans, which we had some nice, we had some, I had some nice graphics done. I had the plan, the layout, and met Derek Taylor. And he said, oh, when you come, he said, bring me a list of what your, a wish list of what you want Apple to do. And I will 
I give me a, and I write, I'll give you marks out of five or ten as to the likelihood of it happening. So I write this list. Will will the Beatles attend the opening? Mm -hmm. Will I get photographs? Will will you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I can't remember all the questions. And Derek was very gracious. He listened to me. We had lunch, and uh, he he said, "Give me a list. Will the Beatles attend? Not. <laughs> <laughs> will Apple endorse? Will Apple endorse the exhibition? No." <laughs> Will we get photographs? Five. <laughs> uh, uh, but there were, there were some positives, but there were an awful lot of negatives. Mm -hmm. And then, right, I need to meet to meet Apple. I need to meet Neil Aspinall. He's he's the boss. Oh, he's busy. Anyway, eventually, you know, I was taken. I was given an, an audience with oh, yeah. Neil Aspinall. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I met Neil and Derek again, went through the whole thing with, with them. And Neil said, I don't want you to do this. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Why? Uh, well, because if it goes, if it fails, like Beatles City failed, I will get all the, the I'll get the blame. I said, what do you mean you'll get the blame? He said, I get the blame for everything that goes wrong in Beetle World. <laughs> he said, I've got four masters. Paul, Ringo, George, and Yoko. And anything that goes wrong in their world, they come to Neil Aspinall. They don't go to them, they come to me. So I get the world's press going, Neil, why is Paul not speaking to Ringo? Why is Ringo refusing this? Why is Yoko calling Paul? He gets it all. So he said, if you fail, I'll get the press ringing me. What happened to the Beatles story? I don't want you to do it. Well, I said, well, we're going to do it. I don't think you can stop me. I, love it. I don't know how I, how I could come out with that. You know, this is Neil Aspinall, the boss of bosses. And I'm going, I don't think you can stop me. And in the end, he went, I went away, came back again, and he went, okay. I said, can I have it in writing? He said, no. <laughs> so I love it, your persistence. Yeah, but, but with that background of Apple not giving permission, putting it in writing, I had to go back to my shareholders Mm -hmm. and convince them to carry on putting the, the money, money in. in. Yeah. And, and again, somehow I did that. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, anyway, yeah. <laughs> we, 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 did get, we did get some help from Apple. They, they did supply us with photographs and they made, it, they made it easy for EMI to let us use the music mm -hmm. and for other people to let us use film. So... They they did help. I, I, you know what I, I think when they met us, they thought these are not cowboy. This is not your typical businessman. This is a guy who was at the cabin. This is a guy who's genuine. Mike and Bernie, they're not business people. They're not out to make a quick book. You know, yes. So I think, and I think probably Derek Taylor. I must give credit. He probably said to Neil, you know, they know what they're doing. They're going to do a good job. Mm. And so we're thankful for that. But you are the complete opposite of JR. <laughs> <laughs> yes. JR wasn't a fan. He didn't care about the Beatles. All he cared about was money. You knew the Beatles from the earliest days. You cared about everything. You loved the culture. Yeah. You loved the music. So yeah, they saw that it was genuine in the passion that you had. So I love that. I, and that, that carries through to them. Yes. Now, um, getting the rights to the music, we, I want to talk about that because not only included McCartney Productions, George Harrison songs, and Yoko and Ringo's management, but at that time, also Michael Jackson. 
Yeah, well, we, we through EMI, we got permission to do the music because you, you know, there's a particular license for that. Um, but the the songwriting side, of course, was owned by the individuals. So, oh, owned by Michael Jackson. Yeah. And so we we wrote. I mean, in those days, there was no internet. There was no emails. So it was on fax. A fax machine, you know, we had a fax, we still got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Can't even remember that, how to work it now. <laughs> so, say, for my younger viewers, that's a machine that we used to use in the 80s. <laughs> yes. And um, so we would, we, we had, we had Yoko's. Management. Wasn't it? We had Yoko's fax and we were sent, don't talk to Yoko, you've got to talk to Yoko's lawyer. And um, sorry, sorry, not Yoko's. Yes, yes, Yoko told us to get in touch with Michael Jackson's lawyer. Okay. So we, so can you imagine us? Th this is two two amateurs. amateurs in Liverpool sending faxes to Michael Jackson's lawyer, mm -hmm. saying we're opening this Beatle exhibition. We want permission to do that. Anyway, we didn't hear any, and so. We, we just went ahead. We, we heard from George Harrison, which said, OK, Paul wished us luck. Mm -hmm. And I think Ringo ignored us. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we did it really without. On a wing and a prayer. Without <laughs> permission. Nobody but came after you? Nobody came after us. Um, but I, you know, because we did it in Liverpool, they went OK. I think if we tried to do it in another country, you know, in America, I think they might have stopped it. Yeah. But because we would did it in the birthplace of the Beatles, they went, okay, yeah, Liverpool needs a Beatle exhibition. These guys are going to do it properly. Yeah. Let them do it. Um, was there any other? The, the, only, the only other thing that came back to us later was when we'd, built it put all the publicity oh, out yeah. mm. we got a, a letter saying we couldn't use the extended t yeah. on the logo in beatles mm. oh, really yeah, yeah. Uh, and to me it was like petty. that is so petty mm. exactly what was the big yeah. deal about the extended t well it looked like they condoned it i suppose and or they had opened it i think if we use the exact logo i, same I as don't those. know rich that was mm -hmm. why that that's the beatles logo so exactly. we, we're doing a tribute to the beatles mm -hmm. we're calling it the beatles story so mm -hmm. that's anyway. that's how they're depicted and to be honest i would have i would have argued it i would have gone to court <laughs> Good. Knowing you, yes. <laughs> You're like, you really can't stop me, can you? <laughs> so I would have got the court, but my oh, no. my partners who had most of the shares went oh, no way. No. <laughs> so they took they took the extended tea out. And I mean, funnily enough, when we were doing the book. We I my first thing I had the extended tea and I was and they went. Take that out. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to bring any attention to Apple. <laughs> uh, Ringo ignored you. The reason I bring this up was because years ago, I remember him in an interview saying that he did not want to do any more fan autographs, pictures, or anything. And Paul was making fun of him. He goes, Oh, peace and love, peace and love. That's Ringo. <laughs> and he was even saying, He goes, I don't know what Ringo's big deal is. He goes, The fans are the reason we're here. So I was just. Yeah. Does he want to not, not, of course, not distance himself from the Beatles because that's where, why he is where he is now. But do you think that he's just so sick of it? I think he probably is. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, he, he doesn't he doesn't talk about Liverpool with affection. No. Paul no. does. Paul loves Liverpool. Yeah. But no. Doesn't doesn't really want to know. No. It was funny when you mentioned the thing with uh, Pete Bass and Charles. It was uh, Paul didn't, or no, sorry. Yeah, Charles didn't tell me exactly what was going on, but 
the issue was more with Ringo than Pete. So that I can definitely say he didn't tell me the story. But when you said it must be Ringo, and that's why I'm asking you these questions because it seems like out of well, the only two left are Paul and Ringo, but it's just that he doesn't really want to do anything as much with the Beatles as like he isn't embracing yeah. like Paul does still. Oh, Paul, Paul, yeah. Paul will go on forever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He will. And, you know, Ringo, Ringo's Ringo. Yeah. yeah. He's, it's he's, fine. Um, I mean, I don't think he's ever been to the exhibition. Mind you, uh, probably Paul hasn't, but you don't know. I he think might... it might be when he got his head chopped off. <laughs> we, we had a... Wait, what happened? Did you hear about the, the story? No, it, we had um, somebody, you know, when you see these topiary figures, you know, when they clip yeah. the head off. Yes. Um, outside one of our stations in the suburbs, not in the city centre. Um, it was for an anniversary it was, the, it was the city, when we became uh, 2008 culture. Capital of Culture. Yeah. Um, they, they created they were, this uh, figure of the Beatles in a topiary hedge. Topiary. topiary, yeah. And, and Overnight, but, um, when they came to see well, it the next morning, Ringo's head had been chopped off. Because he'd he'd he's, said he's I, I don't care about going back to Liverpool. He said he didn't want to come back to <laughs> Liverpool. <laughs> they, chopped his, they chopped his head off, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> he he really needs to buy that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Come on, Ringo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. No, I, and I, I have yeah. a personal. I have a friend, a personal friend of mine who lived opposite Ringo when he was growing up. She actually taught him to read and write. Oh. And, uh, he's just never, ever acknowledged her, ever. And um, when he got married, when he, everything, you know, he just, so maybe it's just his personality, so. Mm. Yeah, that's unfortunate, <laughs> that's a shame. because I, I, I'm yeah. just the opposite. I appreciate everything that everyone has done for me and I will, you know, give them accolades as much yeah. as I can, show show my appreciation. So I'm just the opposite. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's hard for me to understand how somebody could be like that, where they it's help them get to where they are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's, everyone's different, I guess. He's, he's not even the best drummer in the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> oh, dear. oh, man, that's great. I love it. So oh, dear. That, that's the end of my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, nobody's going to be cutting your topiary head off. I can tell you that. <laughs> he didn't do it, honestly. Uh, Ringo, Ringo's not, not going to back me again. <laughs> he's he's got to learn not to mess with Mike Byrne, Mike and Bernie Byrne. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that you've got all the music, all the pictures, all the photos, they, Apple helped you out. The music, you sort of said, well, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, now came the daunting task of breaking ground. That must have been fun. <laughs> It was fantastic because it was so late in the day. We, we'd, hoped, we'd hoped to be open by the Easter of 1990. And we only got permission. I only got the green light, as it were, in December of 89. Mm. And I'm going, hang on, we'll never get open for Easter. Mm. But we had a fantastic team mm. of builders yeah, and, and electricians, architects. architects that... The, the, the team got behind it. I mean, before we even got into building ending, the, the basement of the dock had to be cleared and a, a concrete slab. You know, that takes weeks and weeks and weeks. The concrete's got to set. Oh, and the, and the other interesting thing was um, with, with the roofs being so low and it being a basement, it was going to get very hot and we needed air con. They couldn't put the aircon in the ceilings like they normally do because there was no room. So it was designed in uh, into the concrete. So all the aircon is vents underneath the concrete. So all that had to be thought through, you know, thought mm -hmm. through. Um, the walls of the dock, because they were adjacent to the dock water, mm -hmm. the, the, the brick... Tides. We have tides on the River Mersey. The, yeah, the tide came in and out and and water came in and there's big pumping stations to keep the water out of the dock. Um, but the, the the bricks, the whole bricks used to sweat um, salt. Mm. So salt would be coming out of the bricks. So all that had to be stopped, 
All the bricks had to be treated, sealed, you know. Um, so all that happened. And then, then we had to go in and build it. And But our, our, our plans, we knew what we wanted, the 18 fe features. Our architect followed our instructions absolutely perfectly. And, and so the build really got on pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and we were there, oh, we were there 18, 18 hours a day, seven days, eight days a week. Um, you know, <laughs> so, sorry. Um, it was, you know, and our kids, our kids never saw us, you know, I mean, they, they brought themselves up, didn't they? I, they could have been up to anything. Um, they, they were made up because they, they, there was no discipline. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but it was, it was great. And the, I was down there at eight o'clock every morning with, on site with the, with the guys and even as we were going along we we would build we'd get into a section and we go you know what we need we need a bit more room there and so you know bernie and i would have a meeting every night when we got home and we'd talk about it and the next day we'd go back to the architect and say you know that wall there can you move it three feet yeah that's and if people walk through, you've got to would, imagine that they'd they congregate, would, you know, and gather, wouldn't they? They yeah. would do that for yeah. us, you know. Yeah. The team were Brilliant. fantastic. Yeah. Um, and we were so lucky. And um, the Albert Dock people, well, the Albert Dock company, unfortunately, weren't as good as our builders, you know. They were putting pressure on us to open. We want rents, you know, they wanted the rents. Very, very expensive rents down at the Albert Dock. Um, the, I mean, was, the rent was £25,000 a year then. The, the security was the same amount. Mm. The, the service charge was £25,000. So we had to find £1,000 a week before we even, you know... Anyway, anyway but it be, there were lots of setbacks um, not, not nothing to do with the build. All that went very well, but the setbacks were still the council mm. not wanting to know, not helping us. I mean, one story we have is when we went to this massive trade fair in London mm -hmm. called World Travel Market. Everybody, every country goes to World Travel Market. So we're there trying to give our leaflets out and our tourism board wouldn't give our leaflets out because we hadn't joined. We hadn't joined a membership, a yearly membership. <laughs> Not that we weren't going to, we just didn't have time. Mm. So, you know, you had this still silliness from the tourism side yeah. not helping us, you know. But we, we just... Yeah. Well, we just went on and on. They've had to, they have had to change it since COVID, though, haven't they? They've had to open the entrance because people can't mix or get too close now. They've had to open up the entrance. In fact, they had to change the whole beginning, really, mm. which is a, a bit of a shame, really, because it loses its impact as you walk in. The first part is not the same as we did, but. But it's it's it due to story. it's due to that COVID. It's it's also due to the, the number of people. The huh? number of people. Instead, we we were expecting one hundred and fifty thousand a year. It's now three hundred thousand a year. And it's um it's all done with earphones now instead of well, boards and things because it's in every language. Yeah. So people can do it with their phone it's, or the earphones. But it is it is it is amazing what Liverpool has become now. It's now it it's now Beatle City. Everybody. Say, I'm sure. I'm sure the tourism board loves you now. <laughs> oh yes, 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 we're quite popular now. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine. So now, is in Liverpool? Is it? Do you still have a lot of restrictions due to COVID? Because in the U.S., it's really not that bad anymore. We're pretty much back to normal. No, we're we're pretty much back That's back to normal. Guess, yeah. It's um, yeah. it's only on some transport. Mm. Uh, but no, it's it, it's all open now. Although there are still cases. Yeah. 
Well, they're over here too. Yeah, there's still cases. Yeah, but yeah. for the most part, we don't really have to wear masks anywhere. I mean, it's no. optional. No. optional, not mandatory. Um, well, you're talking about all the leaflets and everything. You still had a lot of great friends from the 60s, the Mercy Beat bands that helped you with photos, leaflets, tickets, yeah. and posters. So they donated a lot of the things that they had. Is that what happened? Oh, oh they did. Yeah, because I, I involved um, as many friends from groups in the very beginning, brought them down, showed them what we were doing, and um, and they, they were enthusiastic. Well, there was a gang of them who weren't enthusiastic. But the ones, you know, some really good guys just great. came out with with flyers that you will see in the book. There's posters yeah. and the it stuff in the exhibition. The exhibition yeah. um, and some of the guys uh, actually painted the backdrop of the cavern. And I think we've got a few pictures in the book. Yeah. Of, and those guys are from a band called The Foremost. And yep. The Foremost were managed by Brian Epstein. And John and Paul wrote some wrote the hit records for them. Wow. Yeah, I did not know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you know, they were the guys who helped us, and um, the Remo Four. We got some good, good and the Mersey Beats. Yeah. You know, so that was really good. You also had Donny Andrew, Bill Harry, his wife Virginia, Bob Wooler, and once again Charles Rosenay. They all helped out. Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, Del Fra Delaney. Frank Delaney. No, not Frank. Uh, Paddy. Paddy Delaney. Yeah, uh, and as you say, Bill Harry, the the boss of the Mercy Beach. He he. Well, we dedicated a room to him and his wife Virginia, and uh, they they were all, always helpful. And um, Jerry Marsden of Jerry and the Pacemakers. I mean. He, he, he did our opening day, you know. Um, we wanted we wanted a beetle, <laughs> but we didn't get a beetle. But but Jerry Marsden was the the next, you know, the nearest to the Beatles. He was a great friend of the Beatles, and he he'd had three number one records consecutive, you know. Um, and he he was a good friend of the exhibition. Any time I asked Jerry to come and do. You know, would would he would he do it? Would he represent? Would he be a, a guest? He always came down. Didn't charge me any money. You know, well, I know Bernie also. The both of you have a history with Jerry because I think it was the first time you saw the Beatles. There was a riot, and he gave you a ride home. Yeah, yeah. And he he um, he was on the same bill, and um, we were standing outside. A couple of teenagers crying because my friend's coat had been stolen and it was pouring with rain. And he said, well, if, if, you, if they came out, they were loading their gear back into the van, you know, and they said, well, if you hang on till we've done this, we'll give you a lift home, which we were so grateful for, you know. And, um, oh, yeah, he was just a very generous man. He was um, sadly no longer with us now. It's two no. years. It was two years since he passed yeah. I don't know, two years ago, yeah. I love Jerry and the Pacemakers. I used to be a disc jockey at an oldie station, and I played all that stuff. The, oh, the, yeah. Jerry and the Pacemakers. If I knew back then, I would have added the Roadrunners, if I could find that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll send you our record. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so I'll, send you, um, I'll try and send you an MP3 or something, yeah. <laughs> No, I, re I really would love to hear that. Please, if you yeah. can do that, please do. Uh, okay. Now, after all was completed with that, you had voiceovers, et cetera, everything. Now it was time to promote, which you are very good at. Did you have any people that didn't have faith that you would succeed? Taxi drivers? Taxi drivers would, would you? What? When we sent out how many invitations? Um. What was the question, Rich? No, I'm asking because, like I said, I, I wanted to talk about how you had it all completed. You had voiceovers, the text, the pictures, the leaflets, posters, and then it was time to promote, which I know you're the master of promotion. Did you have anybody, <coughs> any people that didn't have faith that you were going to succeed? Ah, hmm. yes. <laughs> the locals. <laughs> the local people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah, the locals, we, 
still have that thing about what have the Beatles done for Liverpool? But one of the one of the promotion ideas we had was the taxi drivers are the people who bring people meet yeah. and greet. Yeah. I love this at the stations, at the bus station. Mm -hmm. Right, they're the guys I Never want to yeah. tell where we are. Right, I get in touch with all the taxi companies. There were three big ones in Liverpool. Sent, got in touch, said, right, please let your drivers know that they are all welcome with their families, free of charge, to the Beatles story between, I gave them two weeks, a two-week window, from there, there, there to that, as many, let them all come down free of charge. So there was 1,500 taxi drivers. 14 came. 14 out of 1,500. Yeah. You know, because they all, oh my God, we know it all. Isn't that awful, you know? And, and it was to their advantage. You know, because they, they would have made more money by doing that, you know. And what's so strange now is every taxi driver in Liverpool is now a Beatle guide. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. see them, you see them with their photographs telling the story. <laughs> That's funny. It, yeah. It's we, similar to the tourism board. Back then, they're like, yeah, it's Beatles, it's come on. And now they're like, oh, Mike and Bernie, <laughs> they've done so much for Liverpool. We cannot appreciate you enough. <laughs> yeah, and and, the, the, uh, and there's still a lot. There was still a lot of snobbery about Liverpool, oh, yeah. about about it being a rundown, a you know, a rubbish yeah. place to be, yeah. trouble. And so when we would go to these travel promotional market. markets, travel markets, and we would we would have our stand, you know, Liverpool comes to Liverpool. People from down south, you know, we're up north. The southerners would walk past our stand and go, "Ooh, <laughs> Liverpool! Who would want to go there?" You know. What about Manchester? Honestly, there was so much of that. I mean, that's changed. You know that yeah. that has changed. But 1990, we we were we were looking for tourists. Yeah. So what yeah. I'm guessing is that was was it the exhibition an initial success? Yes, it was a critical success. But it wasn't a financial success. It was from day one, it was a critical success. Everyone said, wow, this is fantastic. Unfortunately, in 1990, when we opened, um, I, I'm not sure if it was the year before 89, um, the Lockerbie air disaster. Mm. Remember the plane was blown up over Lockerbie? Yeah. That put an awful lot of Americans off coming, yeah. coming. We that affected the American market. And the other thing that happened in 891, the Iraq, the first Iraq war. Mm -hmm. And again, um, your your uh, American compatriots also said, we're not going to Europe. Mm -hmm. And so, understand, well, so yeah. there was we we lost and and there was a recession in Britain as well. So those three things, the recession, yeah. Lockerbie, and the Iraq war, wiped out the what tourism, uh, <laughs> you know, for, foreign visitors. So Beatles story didn't start making money until 1994. Four years for people to but finally feel... It's so changed. I, no, it's definitely changed now. And I'm so glad that the two of you persevered and everything you went through to get this done, and you didn't just say, you know what, it's not worth it. I need, I need to take a break from this. So, I'm so glad that both of you are stubborn enough to make this work. <laughs> oh yes, oh yeah, we're st still making it work. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know what? Now we're at the point where I want to talk about the exhibition. We talked about everything else. As I mentioned before, it's broken down into 18 features. The first feature. Let's start. Let's go through them all. The first one is the war years. The war years, well, the war years, well, it was, as I say, it was all on boards and things, and we used to have sounds of air raids, sirens, and things like that. But now, because of COVID, it's changed, hasn't it? So it's all sort of That's reduced right. to 
um, reading that from the boards. You have to. You have to so, it, talk about the features. Yeah. Mm. Then so, uh, it goes into. Um, we went then into um, a feature, the second feature, which was about the influences on the Beatles. Mm. You know, so their influences were rock and roll, the yeah, stars, Elvis, Elvis Bill Haley, etc. Yeah. And um, so again, so what we wanted to do in the first two features, the first was the war, sirens, uh, Glenn Miller music. We wanted in the first two features to get people out of 1990 and back into the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Mm. So, so that was very important in the first two features to get mm. people's mind away. Because bear in mind that each feature was well soundproofed, so you couldn't hear any other mus music or sounds from the previous section, yes. yeah? So then, so you went the war years, then the influences. And then what do we do next? After that, we have Hamburg, which I love. <laughs> I want to talk about this because according to the book and according to what you said, Pete Best had one week to learn the songs for the Hamburg years. Yeah. I mean, he, he was like, well, they were playing, they were at the Casbah playing and rehearsing. They get a call. Alan Williams says, do you want to go to Hamburg? Yeah, we haven't got a drummer. <laughs> so, but you know, Pete, Pete, Pete knew the songs, I think. He, he would know most of the songs because it was, they were doing basic rock and roll then. So, you know, go to Hamburg and that's all. Just, so we, 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 as I said before, we, we just want to recreate the feel of Hamburg. So it's got the bright lights, it's got the neon, a big star club sign entrance with the music and, and German sounds. And one feature um, is, is that we've got a window which depicts um, Stuart's, Stuart's, Stuart's and, and Astrid's flat, you know. Yeah. So that works well. People have got lots to look at there, the sound. And then we go through another soundproof section into the back, in, back to Liverpool, Mersey into beat. the Mersey Beat. So you have the Mersey Beat office, that was next. And then after that, we have uh, Percy's Music Shop. And that's where John bought his first guitar. Yeah, and and uh, probably every other group <laughs> bought something from Hesse's. Mm. Because it wasn't the biggest music shop in Liverpool, but it was the friendliest. <clears throat> and they had, um, they had a guy selling guitars who was a guitarist himself he was he was also an act he was he used to be a country singer and uh he he would welcome you in all right lad come in what do you want with his good old liverpool accent come on lad um and he would he would sell you guitars or bass or drums and uh, he would also teach before you went out, he would try and teach you three chords. Okay. <laughs> His name was Jim Gretty. Oh, yeah. And so Hesse's was important. And I, I knew the, the owners of Hesse's. And so they helped me. They said, yeah, we'll do it. They gave me all the instruments. They, they, they dressed it themselves. And that was the beginning of Matthew Street. Next, and I want to talk about this because you have a funny story about how realistic this place is. That room is. Hey, well, it's it's a miniaturized, it's miniaturized Matthew Street. Yeah. Again, it's dark. We we cooled it down. Uh, we wanted to make it feel cold, so we had fans blowing, mm -hmm. and they used to drink in the there was a grapes. There was a pub at the bottom of Matthew Street called The Grapes. So we've got a facsimile of The Grapes pub with windows, with movement behind, the sound of people drinking there. And then it's all cobbles like it was, cobblestones. And it looks like warehouses the whole way up the street. And, fruit and fruit as you were, oh yeah, we, ha we actually, had, um, the, it was behind the fruit market. It was the fruit market. Yeah. And so the smell of apples and oranges and things, we had these 
little machines that gave off an aroma that made you feel like you were in a street um, with the fruit. Market, so you, you, could, you could smell that. And then we had the sound of the tavern, the oh, basement. We had the, um, the cat festival on the bin. Oh, the sound yeah, <laughs> the far end. Yeah, we, we had this, we had a drain pipe with a rat running along it. <laughs> it's a real one. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and uh, and yes, yeah, the sound of a jumping onto a dustbin yeah. lid and it, it uh, rattled the lid, you know. Yeah. So. Um, anyway. And of course, so when in the real Matthew Street, as you walk down towards the cabin for a lunchtime session or a night session, you would hear the bass. You could hear the bass of the guitar coming out. Boom, boom, boom. And so we recreated that by booing, putting a subwoofer in behind, behind um, a facsimile. Yeah. So you had all this effect. You had the smell, you had the sound of the pub, you had the cat wowing, and you had the boom, boom of the bass. So you were, you, again, it's this word we use, you're, you're immersed in the feeling of what it was like. And that, that's what we wanted to give the visitor. This is what it felt for us. You will feel the same. Well, it's so realistic that people actually try to walk through, open up that fake door. Yes, yeah. they did. Oh, yes. They were trying to get in the pub. In the pub. <laughs> we had a mirror, full size mirror at the end, so it looked twice as long. So people, <laughs> they would think there was people at the other end and it was them. <laughs> yeah. And um, the, the cavern, you know, the cavern entrance yeah. was well, exactly. Oh, like it except we couldn't go down we couldn't go any deeper because we were already on the seabed so yeah. they had to go down a couple of steps instead of the 18 steps they used to be what 18 18 steps yeah well, the next stop and your um, exhibition is the cavern club oh, mm. yeah well you you would go up matthew street you'd hear the boom 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 then you go into the cavern the first thing you see is the coffee bar and uh, you turn around and you're facing the stage because <clears throat> the, uh, our replica cavern club is almost the same size as the original section, middle section where the bands played. So it's almost the same size. Mm. And so you've got the sound of the Beatles doing Twist and Shout. You've got an introduction by Bob Waller, the DJ who says, hi there, all you cave dwellers. Welcome to the best of sellers. We've got the hi-fi high and the lights down low. Here we go with the Beatles show, you know. <laughs> so we got Bob Waller actually did that for us, you know. Yeah. And, um, and then we've got photographs of the cab Beatles at the cabin all around. And so we've, we've got the effects, all the effects. So yeah. it makes people feel, wow, was this it? Yeah. You know, people... People stand there and they get photographs taken and they just love being yeah. in this replica cabin because it's the closest thing. Well, do I have this correct? Or maybe I'm maybe I don't. Julian Lennon actually played there. No, he didn't play. He came down. He was interviewed in the cabin. Yeah. Okay, that's in. what it was. So I remember seeing him in the book and I wasn't sure if he actually played in that. The cavern no. replica, but no. So, but he actually came down there. So that's another. Uh, oh yeah, he, he was interviewed for a television program there. Oh good. Well, what impressed Jerry me Marsden. about that place? Oh god, sorry. What was that? Sorry, Jerry Marsden played there. Oh. Uh, the the swing in blue jeans played there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what impressed me was I didn't realize this until I read your book. Was the Beatles played two hundred ninety-two times at this club? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, maybe. So, I mean, they were, they were there nearly every night. I mean, when they weren't in Hamburg, they would play the cavern. Well, three times a week, wasn't it? They would, well, and nights too. Mm. Oh. Well, they would yeah. play there all the time. No, I was going to ask you about that because um, Bernie used to go on break from the salon to see them play. What time were they playing? In the afternoon? Like what, what, what time were you working? Oh, at lunchtime. They, yeah, they, they, they did what we call lunchtime sessions. And I used to try and make sure my lunchtime coincided with the time that they knew they were on. So um, I would make sure my clients, my hair, people coming in for their hair to be done, 
and say to the receptionist, don't boot me between so and so, so and so. <laughs> Just about gave them to run down to the cabin and get back ready to looking like a wet, bedraggled rat, you know, <laughs> so hot. <laughs> How long do they play for? Because somebody was telling me that a lot of their concerts in the very beginning were like 25 minutes long. Is that correct? Um, no, I think they played longer than that. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, no they, they would play longer than that. No. Okay. Once they got famous, they were down to 25 minutes. But um, no, the Cavern and the, the okay. Liverpool clubs, no, they would do 45 minutes, an hour. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, no, they, they did proper proper sets. I mean, lunchtime set, they'd do two sets. So they'd probably do two 40-minute sets. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think the person who I was speaking with probably meant when after they made and they were playing bigger, bigger yeah. plays. Oh, yeah. 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 No, in, in Liverpool, they, they did long sets. Next up, we have NEMS. That is the North End Music Store. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's um well, we've we, got the booths in my we depicted Brian's NEMS record shop with the booths and we had uh, my Bonnie playing out of the booths, you know, because that was the first record that the Beatles recorded in Hamburg and people asked for it in Liverpool. So you know, so that was playing there, and then there was a yeah. we had a wall of records and re our albums stuck to the ceiling because that's how they were in NEMS. Yeah, so we recreated that and then that led into uh, Abbey they, Road. They recorded 191 songs there. Say again? No, I said, according to your book, the Beatles recorded 191 songs at Abbey Road Studios. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Incredible, yeah. incredible, you know. And, and again, it was just amazing that they were so lucky to have George Martin. Yes. You know what? It's, I mean, especially watching these documentaries that came out recently, the Peter Jackson one. Also, there's a great um, interview with Rick Rubin interviewing Paul McCartney. And they just talk. I did not realize, I did to a certain extent, but like how much George Martin actually did for the band. He'd say, you know what? You play guitar in this. Why don't you try piano in this? No, I get rid of this, put the harmonica there. Just the way that he heard it in his head and said, yeah. try this, trust me, it's going to work. And yes. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. He changed the tempos of some of the songs as well, didn't he? Yeah. You know, do that faster, do that slower. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he, he was, he was an amazing. Um, imagine how patient he was with them. So patient. Ooh, yeah. Mm. To just, let them have their head, let them do what they want and let them experiment. Um, and, and then, you know, listen to when, when, as soon as they got into, you know, do it, looping things, playing, playing songs backwards, you know, any other producer might have gone, I, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I'm not interested. George mm. Martin went with it. Mm. What I love back then, there's a documentary called uh, um, Music in the Canyon. It's all about Laurel Canyon or Echo in the Canyon, all about the Laurel Canyon years. And they talked about how, you know, the, there was there was competition, but everybody supported each other back then. And one example was that Brian Wilson heard Rubber Soul and he said, you know what, I got to top that. So he came out with Pet Sounds. Beatles heard Pet Sounds and said, we got to top that. And they came out with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. <laughs> and last night, I heard this story before. Paul McCartney was saying that uh, Sgt. Pepper's came out on a Friday. That Sunday or two days later, he went to go see Jimi Hendrix play. Jimi Hendrix was already playing a cover song of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Yes. And it was, uh, yeah. Yeah. So you know the story. So he said he was playing with the whammy bar and he, the guitar was out of tune. because It's all he goes, is Eric there? Is Eric? He was looking for Eric Clapton. The so he goes, "Can you tune my guitar?" <laughs> and Eric Clapton was going like this. <laughs> but he said, "But he said it was so impressive." I saw in one of the documentaries I saw they they had a clip of that in uh, Jimi Hendrix. I love his version of it. I mean, two days later, he already had uh, Sergeant Pepper's memorized and playing it live. Amazing, amazing. 
I just, the reason I bring that up is like I like the fact I know there was egos involved with some, but I like the fact that for the most part, everybody, those big bands got along and they used what they were doing to better themselves. Like, you know better what? I love this. I want to top that. No, wait. You, that That's okay, but wait till you hear this. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm great. I should say they work together. That Laurel Canyon film, I, I saw that a few weeks ago. Yeah. And Right. Everybody was in each other's houses. Yes. You listen to this, play this. Yo, great. I know. Because they would go to a party and say, oh, yeah, I'm writing this new song. And they play it at a party. And like, oh, that sounds yeah. great. It's just, it seems yeah. like they just yeah. out. It was funny because I got lucky. I saw the documentary when it first came out in the theaters. And two weeks later, I went to California to visit a friend. And I said, there's got to be a, um, a, a canyon tour. And I looked it up. There was, and the guy that did it is great. So uh, he, but he was more all about the uh, geography and the the mountains and the canyon. And I said, "Oh, what about this? What about that?" He goes, "Wow, I should add that to my tour. Wow, that's interesting." He was more about. It was called the the hippie hideaway. It was just hippie. Yes. Hippie. Great guy, but it was he was more about the geography. And I'm like, no, but what about John Lennon over here and Brian Epstein and George Martin? Really? Wow, that's really. That's, I should add that to the. <laughs> I, 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 I told him, I said, I, should, I could be a co host, a co tour guide with you. Because <laughs> it was the movie was so fresh in my head that I knew all yes. the different stories. All different oh, I, I, I love that brilliant. time period. I'm, I'm 53, but my favorite time period for music is definitely like the late 60s, 70s. I just love that. That's why working at an oldies music station as a disc jockey was one of the best times for me, one of my wow, favorite jobs. I'll bet, I'll bet it I was. got to play and I, I learned so much because to, in order to uh, make the show more interesting, I would look up facts about the band. So I learned so much about the music while I'm playing it and I would never ever change. How, I wish I was still doing it. I, I had so much fun. Wow. <laughs> now, now I get a chance to meet people like you and interview people like you. So this is great. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're almost done, but coming up next, we have Beatlemania. Mmm, so, so big in people's minds. So what can we do? We want a lot of noise. So again, we, we had all this soundproofing in between each section. So you come out of Abbey Road. We've got, we've got Please Please Me playing in Abbey Road. And then there's a sound tunnel and you can hear Brilliant. screaming from this section. So to depict that, we've got seven big screens just with pictures of screaming girls and as loud as we can have the sound as possible. We want it to annoy people. <laughs> so, um, so that's what it was. So we just had constant screaming for, you know, 20, all day <laughs> in this section so people could see and the images of the girls on the screen you know mm -hmm. and uh, so that that worked really well and then you go through another sound tunnel into the airplane before we get to that though i want to ask you a question because according to your book november 5th 1963 is the day that beatlemania was entered into the english language how do you know that um, it, it was it was advertised in a, in a paper. It, okay. it, they'd been what did they do? Um, the Royal Variety Show, and the next day there were reports in the paper. Someone said they called it Beatlemania. Okay. So, well, November fifth, nineteen sixty three. That's when uh, Beatlemania became a thing. Or yeah, was actually entered into the English language when people started yes, calling yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it was after it was after a big show on television. Okay. Well, as you mentioned, next stop is the airplane going to America. Mm. Well, again, it just comes from our the way that we sat down and designed the whole exhibition. You know, how are we going to depict? all the different parts of what the Beatles did in, yeah. you know, such a few years. Um, and going to America, okay, let, let's get some, let's get some airplane seats. 
You did. So I got in touch with <laughs> Manchester Airport up the road and said, have you got any airplanes? Here? Oh, yeah, yeah, we've got a crashed plane out here. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got the remains of a crashed plane. Um, yep. How many did you want? Oh, well, I'm about 10. So we got these airplane aircraft seats brought over, designed, designed the portholes yeah. with it pic like it was half a pictures plane. of New York behind it, and uh, and then we put in the sound effects. So you came out of Beatlemania into hearing the screaming jet engines. So that all seamlessly. Yeah. you know, moved together. So you, you've got the who screams, now the screaming engines of the plane. Mm -hmm. And we actually found some soundtrack of, was it Murray the K? Yeah. The New York disc jockey? I'm not sure. Murray the K, you said his name I is? Think it was, yeah. Or maybe, maybe it was one of the other guys, but, the but they were now. saying... Um, As they were flying the in. Beatles are flying over the Atlantic now. Um, it's 38 Beatle degrees. Mm -hmm. So again, that's playing as well over the sounds. Well, people yeah. still today go and sit in these seats and feel like they're in the plane. Yeah. I love it. That worked then, very well. Yeah, that sounds like it. And then you go mm. right from the airplane going to America to America and the touring years. Mm. Well, how, how do you how do you condense <laughs> what they did from 1965 to 66, uh, or six, 64 really, the end of 64 to 66? So difficult, so difficult. So we really just had to condense it, and the way we did it was on um, was on boards really and pictures, and we had one AV. Um, um, just an AV thing going on with some interviews. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. That was really difficult to do. Yeah. You know, we would have liked a much bigger space. Yeah. But we condensed it, and it worked. It worked. It, it showed. It showed the. Um, it showed all the tours that they did you know, of America, the Philippines, Australia, and so it gave all the facts on boards and a little bit of music. And some, you know, TV um, yeah. some TV screen, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that worked okay. And then, so that was the, well, that was the touring years. Yeah. And then '66, we show that they they stopped touring at Candlestick Park, and we got into the psychedelic era. Yeah. Psychedelic era, yeah. Which I want I want your opinion on this because you knew them. From the very beginning, did you like that stage to them, or did you say uh, it's a little too odd for me? Did or did you like the progression that they they went in? Um, well, it was all so new then; it seemed interesting. But yeah. I obviously preferred the early days, but um, uh, and I still do. I still prefer the early music. Yeah, the rock and rollers, and it just became a little bit. Bit uh, fairgroundy, you know. It just seemed a little, but it was an incredible production. The album, Sergeant Pepper, you know, I um, mean, very interesting with the the front cover. And we we tried to reproduce the front cover in an alcove, sort of, so you can pick out all the faces if you wish. I think I think what had happened, um, you know, we were obviously Beatles fans and listening to all the progression, the music from Rubber Soul, Revolver. And um, I think this is when we were getting married. We got, we got married in 1967. So and I had my own flat then. I'd moved into a flat on my own in, um, in downtown Liverpool. And, you know, Bernie would visit me there. And, uh, but, we, we, you know, we decided to get married. And that was when... We got married in the September. Sergeant Pepper came out on June, June the first, I think. Yeah. And I had it playing constantly in the flat. 
It mm-hmm. was just up all day long playing. It was like, oh my God, yeah. what is this? <laughs> because it was such a contrast, yeah. again, from Revolver. You know, Revolver had great stuff on it, but suddenly, my God, what's going on there? You know, all these sound effects and the different tones and the, oh, the cacophony of sound and the orchestra and John's songs and, you know, and Ringo with a little help. Just yeah. amazing. And then, of course, the, the actual album itself, The Gatefold. Yeah. What's all that about? You know, and then the words, the all the words on the back. Yeah. Oh, how innovative. Yeah, I, I like a, a mixture of both. There's some people that like either all the newer stuff or all the others. I actually like a lot of a mixture of both. I love the Love Me Do, you know, Can't Buy Me Love Days, but I also like Let It Be. I like Sgt. Pepper's, Hey, yes. Summer. I, it's, I, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle where I like a little bit of both. But I think some they did some of the stuff that's more unknown. I think it's a little too weird. Not weird. Maybe that's the wrong word, but it's not as catchy as like all the older stuff. So I definitely yeah. see what you're talking about, which when um, Paul was being interviewed by Rick Rubin, he made a comment, which I never even thought of. He said when he first started writing songs, he made his songs very simple because he didn't have anything to record them on back then. So he didn't want to forget them. That's why a lot of the songs were just like, love, love, me too. He said, he goes, if I didn't do that, then I would be like, but what's amazing is his memory. You mentioned his memory earlier. He, he played a song. He was, I wrote the song when I was 13 years old. He played it right. I mean, I said, how does he remember this? He didn't record yeah. it. He doesn't have it taped anywhere. <laughs> but he mm. played it and he was singing the lyrics. He was like, oh, yeah, I was only 13. I wrote this yeah. song. I know the lyrics aren't that great. But the fact that he could still remember things like that are amazing. I know, yeah. Very lucky. I, I think they lost us with the White Album. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he got one follower, Charles Manson, but that's about it. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, when they came back with um, Abbey Road, that was great. I love that. Um, I, you know, what what can you say? I know. I, I'm I'm a fan of all Beatles, but yeah, I definitely know what you're saying. That's why I wanted to ask you because you saw them right when they first started, and I just wanted to get. And uh, I I agree with you. So I like. I like a little bit of both. Now yeah. we go to, we went from Psychedelia, which was Sgt. Pepper, a magical mystery tour in Pepperland. Now we're going to go into the Yellow Submarine Room. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we wanted something, we wanted a major feature. I mean, what, what we've got before you go into Psychedelia, you've got the black, what we call the black and white era. That was right up to Abbey Road and Beatlemania. But when you go, psychedelia suddenly everything becomes technicolor it's it's psychedelic it's color and so you came out of the the 65 the touring years which was bland and then you go into this so much color we had strobe lights we had um you know the the wheels the color wheels the oil wheels so we had that everywhere the magical mystery tour bus and and the octopus's garden with with effects underwater sea effects and then you've got this great big yellow submarine sticking out into your face which you go into and it's playing yellow submarine and there's real fish and the portals swimming past the windows (laughs) the the, the, the attention to detail that you put into all of this but I want to have a question about Yellow Submarine. Why were the Beatles so reluctant at this film? Um, I don't know, really. Just, they just... Well, why what? No, why were the Beatles reluctant of this film? And you, you have a story about that in the book. It was because there was another film that happened and it failed. But then when they saw the cartoon, at first they didn't like it, but then it was, they became, they came to love it, according to what yeah. you were saying in the book. Well, I, th- I think what it is, is, is they, when they first became famous, everything was a novelty to them. Wow, look at this. We're going to America. Wow, they want us to make a film. They signed a four-deal 
a four film deal. Mm-hmm. And so after this, after help, they didn't want to make any more films. Yeah. So the third film was Magical Mystery Tour. Yeah. And the fourth film, oh, we can get away with it being a cartoon. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think that's probably what happened. Mm. And so they accepted it. But at the end of the day, Yellow Submarine became a very good film. And, and now, popular you know, it's yeah. really popular. When, when, um, when we first opened the exhibition, I, I would talk to the people as they were walking around. Hi, did you enjoy it? What did I do? And uh, I remember this American with his son there. And I said, well, how does your son know so much about the Beatles? Mm-hmm. He said, well, when he was a kid, I just stuck him in front of Yellow Submarine. <laughs> and that was it. The kid was hooked. <laughs> That's what I love about the Beatles. And now I'm, gonna, I'm talking about Paul McCartney again right now, because last night watching that show, the, the my girlfriend was making a joke saying, oh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of older people there. I said, I don't think so. And when I was there, there was people bringing their sons, their daughters, their grandkids. I mean, there I'm was sure. people of all ages just enjoying the music. So it's not just mm-hmm. like people that were born in the 60s or there were 50, you know, 16, yeah. 17, 60s watching, you know, reliving their past. There was people that never knew the Beatles from like watching, as you said, cartoons or yeah. listening to their dad's records. And stuff. So yeah. I love the fact that the Beatles um, appeal to all ages. Beatles and the well, old stuff of the Beatles. Well, you know, our, our 13 year old grandson is a drummer and his first his favorite song is Hey Bulldog. Ah. <laughs> yeah. He has good yeah. taste. <laughs> <laughs> there was a very mixed audience last night, was it then? Oh actually I went on the second night. Two sold out nights, Fenway Park. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I mean he I guess he's is he playing in in your area? Because I didn't see, I saw the t-shirts and they were all American dates. I didn't see any. Um, I don't think there's a British tour. I, is I think he might be doing Glastonbury. Okay. Because on the, on the shirts that I saw being sold last night, I saw, you know, New Jersey's, uh, Baltimore's tomorrow, New Jersey's after that. Then he did um, California and some other areas. But yeah, I didn't see any London dates or anything. No, no. I'm, I'm hoping he'll come to Europe. Yeah. Uh, um, I yeah. hope his voice holds out. It's well, amazing. No, you know what's funny? I'm gonna. I want. I'm glad you mentioned that because he still hits those high notes, and he still sounded great. And you know what? It also impressed me too because I sometimes I see the older bands and they're reading from a teleprompter. Not, I could not see a teleprompter anywhere. He had all these lyrics memorized. He was da- like I said, he was dancing around on stage. So it's just amazing that. At eight yeah. years old, his voice still holds out very well, and he's not, he still remembers all the lyrics. <laughs> he's, he's, wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think um, his band are clued up to support him vocally if he needs it. I can see that. I know what you mean now because now that you mention it, there was a lot of harmony going on. Yeah, I, and uh, I think I think the drummer is the one, if Paul needs help, the drummer can sing the same as Paul. Uh, that's good, well, he, he's- I, I noticed, we went to see him in Paris about five years ago, and um, he did nearly three hours there. And there was a few times in the middle where it, his voice wobbled a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm a vocalist, so, you know, I, I'm there. And um, so, and I noticed that the drummer would come in wherever there was a weak spot in Paul's voice, you know. But, but what, what was amazing about the concert we saw, maybe, maybe you, you had the same. He did two sets of encores. Yeah, oh, yeah two sets. But the, the last one, or the second, maybe maybe it was the first encore, he does Helter Skelter. Yes. He did that last night. And I'm going, and he got the notes. 
<laughs> and, and that is a ridiculous song to sing, particularly after two hours. Yeah. You know, I, I can't sing for two hours. Well, I can, but it's, you know, it's hard work. I'm yeah. particularly trying to get high notes after doing two hours, you know. Yeah. No, he... That Amazing. was the second to the last song. And as soon as that first no hit, the whole audience, it was like one big cheer. Like, yeah, the whole crowd erupted. I did not expect that song to be played. And yeah, he, he did a phenomenal job with that. And even if the drummer was helping him, just like I mentioned earlier, I said the fact that they surrounded themselves around great people, like with Brian Epstein, George Martin, now he's surrounding himself with a drummer that sounds great in the drums but can also help him out vocally. More power to him. He's still yeah. And you know what I like too? This is this is what gets me mad when I see these bands. Um, oh yeah, it's the farewell tour, and then they come back five years later. Oh, yeah, like Ellen John, <laughs> David Bowie. The yeah. last thing Paul McCartney said was, "I have one last thing to say. I'll see you next time." He didn't say this is my I'm getting older now. He goes, I'll see you next time. And I love that because he's Yeah. Oh yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, how, how is it Tony Bennett? Oh yeah. Yeah. How old is he now? He I don't know. He's gotta be older than Paul, but he's oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, five years older than him, I think. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't know whether he's still singing, but he, he said, you know, he did Fantastic. carry on, didn't he, for a long time. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't even think about him, but I, he's another one that I'm a, I'm a fan. I used to play him in my oldie station. I, I, oh. I, I, not only do I like his music, what makes me like his music even more is his personality. He just seems yeah. like such a friendly, fun guy. I see him on stage. Yeah. He's just like Paul's having a great time. Yeah, you know? yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Well, great. Right, we talked about the Yellow Submarine, and that's going to lead right into the Let It Be room. And this room, I just want to talk about, and then you could elaborate on this. It shows how this this stage of the Beatles became much more somber. Yeah, yeah. It was <laughs> what when you when you do an exhibition, you want to finish on a high. Mm -hmm. But but they didn't they didn't finish on a high. You know, they had, they ended up mm -hmm. arguing. Mm -hmm. So, but we had to show. We had to show the end, the the Let It Be, and Abbey Road. Well, not Abbey Road, um, the yeah. album, and uh, and we wanted to show the solo years as well. But but it was di it was difficult to do. We showed um, the shop, yeah, you know, uh, the fool, yeah. The other, the yeah, other we had a screen showing all these how their lives had progressed, really. Yeah, and, and then. We had a drum, yeah. which just played well. It just depicted the end. It it was it was the breakup, you know. And yeah. um, you you can't you can't be happy about the breakup, really, you know. And we're, we're showing the Apple Shop, which failed, you know. So we had a screen showing the last day where they were giving all the clothes away, you know. Um, but that's all right. And then, then we went into the solo years. Well, yeah, the, I want to talk about the breakup because I, I want your opinion on this because the next room after Let It Be is the breakup. Um, Yoko, I think gets, or she gets unfairly most of the blame for this. I think it would have happened anyway. I mean, maybe she played a part in it, but I don't think she was the main reason the Beatles broke up. What's your opinion? I think, I think they, they'd outgrown each other. Yeah. They outgrown each other. I mean, look, yeah. look. George, George showed his, well, you know, yeah. his frustration yeah. in that film in Get Back, but he also showed in nineteen in um, sixty six where he said, "I've had enough of this. I, you know, I want to finish the Beatles. I'm, I'm leaving." Um, when they stopped touring, and and it went on like that, and then they and then they grew up. Yeah. Basically, they grew up. How, how much more could they do after Sergeant Pepper, after going to Rishi, Rishikesh, mm -hmm. after, you know, doing, becoming separate? They were, they were recording on their own anyway. Yeah. And John was living out with Yoko mm -hmm. in Tittenhurst Park. But Paul was living next door to Abbey Road, mostly, pretty well. So he could, he could just go, mm -hmm. he could go to Abbey Road any time, couldn't he? Yeah. 
you know, uh, what's that? What? I'm seeing some flashing behind us. <laughs> hang on, hang on. <laughs> oh my God, I'll tell you what. We're, we're being haunted. So, we're being haunted, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's listening up there. Yeah, I think it's my Gavin. son. Can you see that? Yeah, I can. As, as soon as you yeah. start talking about John Lennon, everything I'll starts flashing. John Lennon, um, it's 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 like Twin Peaks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's funny? If Charles, if you're watching this, which I know he said he wants to watch this, he can't wait to see it. He runs a paranormal convention, so we can also put this into the paranormal convention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> look, look at right here, live in the claws corner, we have the ghost of John Lennon. You see that picture of John behind us? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's oh, a, my that's God. A, a real oil painting. There's a friend of mine who's an artist painted for us when we uh, opened the exhibition. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> He's going to tell us what to do next. Right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever so, you want, John. So, <laughs> no, I going back to the. <laughs> I thought maybe someone was saying, "No, that's not right, Mike." <laughs> no, no, they, they were, as you said, they're gonna, they'd grow, they they were gonna break up anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's not all Yoko's fault. <laughs> Basically, part of it, but yeah, they would have broken up regardless. But which brings us to the next room, the solo years. So I have a question for you, for both of you. In your opinion, who's your favorite solo post Beatles? Solo post Beatles. Ooh. Paul. Yeah, for me it's Paul. I, I love I love some of the songs George came out with. I like some of the songs John came out with. And I know people say, well, John wasn't given enough time to really. I think that Paul writes the best songs i mean i, I, I do like, i do too i, I do love wings i love post wings i mean everything he's done even like his mm -hmm. new album i mentioned i love a lot of the songs on there yeah i i, I, like, my, I liked um chaos and creation i liked uh, for the singles that they did i think here today when i was doing my tours used to get people in that the coach would cry you know because when i say he wrote it after john died Yes, you know, he played that last. He played that last night and dedicated it to John. Oh, yeah. did he? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I feel. I feel like he. You know, his true feelings. Yeah, I think there. Paul. You know, is my favorite. But then, I admired George I for everything he did. Just... And then the when the Wilburys came out, I went, "Oh, yeah, that's good." And in fact, we were in Dallas when Cloud Nine was released. You know, that, that was George's kind of comeback, wasn't it? Cloud Nine got my mind set on you yeah. when we was fab. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's when, oh, hang on. Yeah. Listen to George again. He was overshadowed because he was the youngest, totally. I think. Yeah. Totally overshadowed. Overlooked as well. Uh, yeah, because... And you're what you're saying is almost ex no, it's the same order so far as me. So first, it's Paul, then it's George, then it's John, then it's Ringo for me. Because I, li I like a lot of songs uh, George came up with, and it was funny because in the interview that Paul did with Rick Rubin, he was saying it was like at the very end, sort of towards the end, that's when George started to become his own and he started to say, want to. Um, write more songs for the Beatles and write more songs. So it's just that it was like in the very beginning, he's like, no, you and John take care of it. Don't worry about it. I'm also, he was happy being just that. Then towards the end, he goes, no, no, I, I have a voice as well. Yeah. And yeah. Definitely showed me. Yeah. And what's that song? It's something. Is that the full name? Something? Yeah, something. Yeah. He played uh, a ukulele version of it. A ukulele yes, yeah. yes. George gave him. I love it. Yeah, yes, right. that's lovely. Yeah. It's a lovely moment because he starts on his own and then the band come in. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so it's good. So between, I'm guessing that your list is pretty much the same as me. The next would be John, then after that, Ringo. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so lastly, this is, this, I, first of all, I want to thank you two. I had so much fun talking about the bees. I can go on for another five hours. I just <laughs> find this fascinating and the fact that I'm talking to two people that knew the Beatles were friends with the Beatles and were there in the very beginning 
it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Oh, pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice to Let, talk to you. Really appreciate oh. you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But lastly, though, and it's another sad room in a way, the white room. We wanted to finish with something a bit spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, something very meaningful. Yeah. And because John had been murdered, yeah. what can you do? And I guess we came up with the idea of recreating a miniature white room. Yeah. And, um, and again, it had to be the most soundproofed yeah. feature of the whole exhibition because we just wanted to play Imagine and we didn't want anyone to hear any superficial right. noise at all. And so you come in, uh, there's the white grand piano, there's the windows, the curtains were moving. We had... We had like a breeze, so, you yeah, know, open the window. as if some, as if they just left the room. And so the piano the and the glasses. lighting effects. We had John's sister Julia gave us permission to use. She gave us one of the family pictures of John, and so we had it framed, and it's on the piano. And we, and as the music started, a, a light came just a spotlight came down onto this picture of John mm -hmm. and and it just played just plays imagine mm. and that's all it does but yeah. but the whole room is just so peaceful really so peaceful and people would come people, out crying the, people the came tears out in their crying. eyes you know just um and every song. time I walked through and I walked through 10 times a day Every time I went through the white room, I got a shiver. Mm. You know, I had the, the hairs on the back of my neck went up. Mm. Oh, yeah. and one night I was in the exhibition on my own at 10 <laughs> o'clock at night. The place, the whole Albert Dock is closed. Everything's switched off. There's nothing on. I'm in the white room and I heard children, children's voices. Mm. That was spooky. <laughs> <laughs> don't know where, don't know where that came from. Well, you seem to attract the paranormal. <laughs> it's happening again. <laughs> it is. It is. It's flickering now. Look. It's flickering again. John, so John, is, John is very <laughs> excited. To be, I could actually say I'm the only person to have John Lennon on my podcast. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Oh, yeah. So, looking down over our shoulder. Well, for the White Room, what did Charles Rose, Rosene donate? Oh, he, he the fingerprints. Isn't it? No, the immigration papers. Yeah. Yeah. Is oh yeah, totally fingerprints. Yep. <laughs> he came in. He came to us one. It'll be a, the Beatle convention. We met, and he said, "I've got something for the exhibition." He said, "What?" He said, I've got John's original immigration papers with his fingerprints on. Would you like it for the exhibition? I said, wow, yes, please. So. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is spooky, Rich. <laughs> it's only when you talk about John. Stop I noticed time. that. <laughs> um, so we we took them, we had them framed, we we fixed them to the wall, we did the story under a caption underneath about them. And I I was very I was very nervous about having them there because they were the only ones in the whole world. And I I just said, you know what? I, I don't want these up here. So I took them down and I had them color photocopied and I put the copy back up. And within a week, they'd been stolen. If I hadn't have done that, the originals would be gone. Yeah. I'm so glad you had the force, the vision to actually say, you know what? This is too important. Let me make a copy yeah. of this. It's, yeah. it's sad that people, because 
Um, I think there's other items that were sadly stolen as well, right? Where people were trying to steal things. Yeah. Through the oh, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Well, particularly posters that be ripped yeah. off, you know. But that, that I'm sure that happens. Any exhibition. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it does. But it's just a shame that you have to actually worry about that. But I'm so glad that you made a copy of that. So that was stolen. Did they ever find the thief? No, no. No, no, but the, the I'd, I'd like to see the thief try to sell the forgery. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, John, what do you think about that? <laughs> what? Oh, it's gone out. Oh, the, the light's gone. It's gone. <laughs> the, light that, the light that was flashing has now gone out. Oh. I don't know what that means, if that's good or bad, but <laughs> good night, John. <laughs> is, that, is that the end Say of the... good night, John. <laughs> Is that the end of the interview? That's <laughs> it's that cobweb up there. <laughs> wow, that is so, the end of the interview. So once again, Bernie, Mike, <laughs> I really do appreciate you being on the show. I love the book, and next August I'm going to meet the both of you. I cannot wait for a tour. Okay, uh, we will see you in Liverpool <laughs> and all your friends. <laughs> well. So a perfect way to end this book or end the book as you did is a poem by Edgar Albert Guest. When I mentioned it in the beginning of the interview, it's entitled, It Couldn't Be Done. Well, you two did it. And I speak for all Beatle fans when I say thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love, love, love you. from us to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> that wraps up the latest episode of The Claws Corner. A huge thanks goes out to the authors of The Birth of the Beatles Story and founders of the most successful Beatles exhibition, exhibition in the world, Mike and Bernie Byrne. I would also like to thank editor extraordinaire John Bristol of Elmwood Productions for always doing a superb job editing this show and making it available each and every week. And lastly, definitely not least, I need to thank you, the viewer, for always tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Diaphragm again? <laughs> ha! We caught one. They're supposed to be weird. Oh, yeah, no. If you say so. I've always wanted to be in a movie. Around, around, around.